Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar uh, from Words to Wisdom Text Analytics Use Cases. I'm Paolo Tamagnini. I'm a data scientist uh, at Nine in the evangelism team and I work in the Berlin office. So first of all, before we start waiting more people to join, let's quickly go on slide and see where you all guys are connecting from. So and go on a second and uh, here we are. Look, Zurich and Austin looks like the most place, but we have even Brazil, Colombia, Bogota there. Yeah, I would say like from a bit all over the place. So keep on uh, uh, using the poll. We will use the, also the poll later on to uh, um, leave a rating for the session. And uh, it's nice to see you guys connecting from all over the planet for this uh, session on text mining, uh, text analytics use cases with nine. So let's now get started and let's go back to the slides. Here we go. So a bit of um, housekeeping rules. We need to use the Q&A section to post uh, your questions. So please do so. And you can also vote the questions of other attendees. The session is recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. We will send you an email with the, how to find the link and so on. And uh, as well as any other downloads and link that you should have. So not stress about that. How do you use the Q&A session? So you should have this button, Q&A, and you go there and you can make your question. In the uh, back with me here in the webinar, we have Scott, who is also a data scientist and I'm and, uh, and works uh, and is also uh, part of uh, the people that built the uh, course on text mining here in I'm. And we have also Francisca, who is uh, the developer of one of those components of the text mining components, also data scientists and nine. So please make your question as I go and they will answer them for me as there is lots of stuff I want to show you today. So um, let's keep going. Uh, from words to wisdom, text analytics use cases, uh, the slides download is available at this URL here. So uh, if you want to, already get your answer on a PDF, it's right there. Webinar agenda. So today we're going to have a really, really quick intro to NIME in case you uh, are not familiar to it and uh, to the NIME text processing extension, what it is, how it works, uh, how it looks. We are then going to start going through a number of use cases. The first is mining social media activity from Twitter. And then we are going through the sentiment analysis with three different approaches. Uh, then we are going to look at the network analysis of user activity on social media, entity recognition or tagging uh, um, words in documents and to automate it, and then uh, topic detection, find what documents uh, are talking about automatically. And then finally, we're going to go through this more uh, let's say sophisticated setup where you want to train a model, but you do not have any labels and you still want to perform what's called machine learning. And that's the, 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 the last use case. So let's now quickly go through what is NIME. So the NIME uh, software ecosystem is basically uh, based on uh, having a way to gather and wrangle all this data from different sources, manipulate it, and then once you, it's ready, you can build a model and visualize it. In NIME to do this, you need the NIME analytics platform. This is a desktop tool. It's all visual. It does its own uh, open source and it is free and open source. You go on NIME.com, you download it, you start using it and you can do whatever you want with it. It's uh, totally free and open source and you have many different extensions and integration that you can install from the core of what you install in the beginning. And all, some of those uh, extensions uh, are also provided by the community and by partners. Now, beside the NIME analytics platform, then, which is free and open source, NIME also thinks, okay, but what can you do once you have your model, your dashboard, how can you uh, make it available to your organization? Um, and that's where you need something to deploy and manage whatever you build and also to make it available to others, right? 
And that is the name server. That's uh, uh, how Nine makes its revenues. It's our commercial offering, and uh, it is uh, uh, not fundamental to all Nine users. But organizations usually need this to also access uh, those workflows via a REST API service, for example, or via the web web browser, like through the Nine web portal. Now, how does Nine works? You have those nodes. And those nodes that do particular function. For example, here we have a group by, and the group by node is only simply aggregating data. Now, this is one node. When you use many nodes, you have a workflow. And this workflow is something that is the, your analytics process itself, from reading, chunking your data, um, and then uh, building a model, visualizing uh, the, the data in different points, and then you can also measure the performance. And all of those, it's uh, presented as a sequence of nodes. And you can always look at the data between two nodes. So it's transparent, user-friendly, no need to code. You can still code if you want. And it's all this via those workflows. Now, when those workflows become a bit too complicated and you want for other people using them to easily reuse them, that's what it's called a component. So you take a workflow, you package it in a component, you decide what are the parameters and what are instead uh, based on the, on the data, on the ports of this uh, component. And so you can share it and it adds just like an outlook here, we have a document pre-processing component. People can use it, think it's just like any other node, but if they open it, we'll find more, node, more, more nodes. And so here we go with all those components, all those nodes, you can do really complicated things. We now I'm going from data access, uh, accessing places like big data platforms, uh, uh, Spark, Hadoop, and so on. You can transform your data. Then you, you can build your model, visualize it all the way to the deployment part. So this is to give you a quick overview in case you didn't know Nime already. Now let's talk a bit in detail about the Nine Text Processing extension. So how does that work? The Nine Text Processing extension is like an extension, a collection of Node in Nine. You can find it on the app, on app.nine.com. You can find all the extension and all the nodes. And when you install it on your Nine, you will find all these collection nodes, which give you the possibility to process documents. Now, there are many of those nodes, and we're going to see just uh, some of them in the use case I'm going to present to you. However, there are also components that Nime is building and verifying for you. Actually, Francisca in the Q&A session made exactly those here that you can use to analyze the documents. And uh, you can find on nine.com slash verified components and reuse them. But some of those components are also made by the community. So for example, today we announced the contributor of the month SJ Porter, because he created those components and shared them on his own uh, app space. So uh, as uh, his own contribution to the community, two components, one of which is really cool because it does lots of text pre-processing using uh, regex ex uh, expression, for example. So anyone can create components and share them. And uh, they are also popular in the text mining fields. So components and uh, nodes. Th those are what we use to do text mining. OK, so to install the text um, processing extension, if you have Nime open, you go file, install Nime extension, install it. If you're on the app, you simply need to drag and drop it. And it's still all part of uh, the Nime free and open source software. So what is the generalized idea between text processing? You have many different kind of documents, which can be in different formats, PDF, Word, CSV, uh, I mean, doc file, TXT file. You import them in Nine, and then you start enriching them. You start tagging, uh, for example, part of speech, what is a verb, what is um, a subject, and so on and so forth. And once you tag all those documents, then you can also do some further pre-processing where you, for example, take away all the stop words, all the words that are not really meaningful, like, for example, words that are too short or uh, words that are like uh, conjunctions or adverbs that you don't need. And then once you have uh, um, um, only the, the documents that you really uh, want to look at, you can basically create 
a document vector. So basically you represent the document as in a numerical format. And then once you, your, your documents have become something that you can represent with a table that is made of uh, numerical values, then you can do anything with it. Visualization, but also um, modeling, data mining, machine learning, all of that. So uh, this is how you can use the, the NIME uh, text processing extension. And, but let's go a bit more in detail of uh, how this works. So you, you can have uh, in NIME a table of documents. Each row is a different document. You can have uh, a bag of words table where each row is a term and, uh, and you can see which document it belongs to. And so you will see the document reference in multiple rows. And finally, you have the document vectors uh, um, table where you have a document per row. And if you have uh, the word uh, in that column, a one, it means that that word is in the document. And this is what you in the end use to train a model. So let's start now with the first uh, uh, use case, mining social media activity from Twitter. To do this in NIME, you need uh, an extension, which is called the Twitter API integration. You can find them uh, uh, online uh, on the app. And uh, basically, will give you the opportunity to use uh, NIME nodes to make your queries to the Twitter API. To use it, you need to have uh, a Twitter development account. And uh, for example, you can use it to find all the tweets with a certain hashtag or find all the user that um, retweeted a certain tweet or uh, for example, uh, who uh, all the followers of a certain user. Each node is made to do one of those particular tasks. And uh, it's really important that you get your uh, Twitter uh, account developer development account uh, working and you get those API keys to use in the Twitter API connector. So let's see a simple example here. I'm connecting to Twitter API, then I'm performing a Twitter search. So I would connect then the Twitter search, and then I would perform here my query where I specify all the hashtag I want using the or and the end based on uh, exactly how it, my query is. Basically, I'm looking for all the tweets that have either of those hashtags, COVID Europe, COVID-19 Europe, coronavirus Europe, and so on and so forth. Then I can decide to search for a maximum amount of tweets, if I want to have the more popular or just the more recent or a mix of the two. And in the end, I get also I can select which fields I want of each tweet. And when I execute the Twitter search, I get a nine table with the user, the image of the user, the tweet body and the tweet ID, the time it was tweeted and all this kind of metadata on the tweet. And, uh, and you can then import them into NIME and do so many different things. For example, here you can see a method node, pre-processed method node are not like components. You're just packaging nodes together in order to make them uh, uh, make your workflow more tidy. So in this meta node, we package those uh, other nodes here. They are going to convert it from strings to document, convert the string with the date, the timestamp in date and time, extract the date and time fields like at uh, what hour the tweet was tweeted. And then we use a rule engine node to basically define whether it was in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And once we do this, we are able then to have all the information to build in this uh, um, component here at the end, you can open its interactive view because inside there are more nodes creating this composite view. And in this case, we you can browse through all the different tweets, the color of the, of the term that is most frequent based collecting in different set, whether it's night, morning, evening, or afternoon. And as you can see, you can browse all those tweets using this uh, interactive tag. Of course, this is only a quick example to show you what's possible once you import all this Twitter data uh, in, in ARM and you want to do, and I could show you this visual way to explore the tweets. But of course, there are other things that you can do with it. So let's go now to the next uh, use case, sentiment analysis of social media activity. So to automatically detect if someone is saying something positive or negative. So let's say, for example, we have a phone, this is a really old phone, this review, I think it's from 2016. We have a Samsung Galaxy S7 and, and it doesn't really matter the phone. Each people will review this phone and will give either a positive or a negative review. And uh, we can tell it's positive simply by reading it, but we can also use the fact that we have the stars, right? But what if 
Twitter, Twitter doesn't have stars attached to, to each uh, uh, tweet, right? So we need to, we, we could create a model that is able to automatically detect the sentiment, whether people are saying nice or bad things. You can do this, for example, with movie reviews, but you can also wonder what are people saying on the social media about my product? What people are saying about this par particular policy uh, uh, or about this uh, uh, per, uh, person that, that during the election, and you can then even think of kind of predict the sentiment uh, over a certain topic, right? That can be anything. So in order to, to show you a use case, we are going to use now movie reviews. We have over 2000 different movie reviews and the movie reviews are collected from this uh, IMDB uh, uh, website. So we have the stars we have the um, positive and negative label. And with that, we can then also measure the performance of our model. So there are three different ways to do this. You can do this lexicon-based, machine learning, or deep learning. And uh, the, the order is also in complexity. Lexicon-based is a really simple approach, which often works. Then machine learning can do something a bit more complex and deep learning is a sort of the state of the art, but it's also uh, quite more complex. So let's start with the lexicon base. So just imagine that you can have a dictionary in your own language or whether it's English, it's perfect. You can quickly tell that uh, awful and uh, horrible and uh, terrible and so on and so forth, they are all words that are negative and then there are words like great and awesome and so on that they are positive you can keep these two set of words in dictionaries and then you can go document by document and count how many words are positive and how many are negative and then divide by the total size of the document and this will give you a score so how do we do this in nine and this is important you can do this as long as you have a dictionary you don't need any labels on your document so we are going to read uh, all these uh, reviews. We are going to convert them from simple strings to documents so that then we are able to uh, filter out all this uh, metadata we don't need. And here we are going to perform uh, dictionary tagging. So basically we are tagging all the positive words. Here we are tagging all the negative words. words. Here we are taking out all the words that are neither positive or negative. And here we are creating a bag of words. And bag of words means that each document is collected as simply a set of words that is either positive or negative. Then we are able to count um, uh, each, uh, how, many, how many times those words are present, uh, uh, what is the total amount for each word. And by doing some simple data manipulation and applying the formula I showed you before, you're able to measure a score how, how positive and how negative each word is. So this is the first approach. As you can see, it's uh, pretty easy to understand, but sometimes is enough because people tend to use always the same terms to say something that was really good or really bad. All right, but sometimes this is not enough. We want to do something more complex. Dictionaries cannot cover all this complexity of sentiment. So we want to um, use machine learning and to do this, we need the labels and we need to convert the documents in a way that the model can learn something from. It. So how do we do that? We need to convert again the documents in the, uh, from strings to document. Then we are going to filter out the metadata. We're going to tag the part of speeches, whether it's a, a verb, a noun, uh, and so on. And then we are going to remove the punctuation, remove numbers, remove words that are too small, remove all the stop words like uh, conjunctions and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, prepositions. And then we are going to keep only the words that are, uh, we are going to convert all the words to lowercase. We're going to prefer stemming. So that is that if a word is plural, or singular, it will look like the same word. So we don't think it's two different words. And then we are going to filter away all those uh, part of speeches that we don't care about. Like for example, uh, to keep only adjective, adverts, and nouns. 
And this point, we can use the, the uh, bag of words uh, creator to uh, see this document as a set of words, and from there create a document vector. So each document is becoming a vector of uh, uh, a number given that word, if it's even in the document or, or how many times is in the document. And then we can train with a training set and a test set uh, the, the decision tree and measure the performance of decision tree. And here we have a decision tree that is able to predict because it learned from the data, right? It learned based on the patterns they are seen on the data, whether a word is uh, a document is positive or negative when he's seeing certain words appearing together. Okay, so this is a, a, a way to uh, approach this. And now there is another way, which is based on deep learning. And we're just going to give you an overview given the time constraint we have, but uh, we are more than happy to answer your questions also on the forum thread afterwards. So deep learning basically is the idea that you still uh, need to come out with a training set and test set, just that you do not create bag of words. You want to keep uh, each document as a sequence of words. And to do this, you need to do some uh, really precise preparation, like truncating documents that are too long, adding zeros for documents that are too short. But in the end, what really matters is that you uh, come up uh, with uh, an architecture which works for this kind of data. And this is a recurrent neural networks, which also need an embedding layer and an LSTM layer. We do not have to cover this in detail, but uh, my point of view often regarding all this hype on deep learning, that sometimes it's not so highly necessary to use deep learning when something could be done with a simpler model. So for example, here there is this meme about when linear regression would have done the job, but someone just really wanted to go with deep learning. You can use deep learning now, just be careful and ask yourself, is this really necessary? So uh, there it is. All right, so next topic, network analysis of user activity on social media. So this topic is uh, uh, about not just measure the sentiment on social media, but also to measure how people are connected to with one another. So uh, we want to know who is talking with who and also maybe uh, um, what what is the sentiment of their conversation, right? Um, let's make an example. The, the, uh, there is an institution that comes out with a new policy and then afterwards is asking, are people happy about the new policy we did? Uh, do they support it or are they against it? What do they say openly and publicly on the internet? And uh, of course, this, uh, there is some privacy and, and all those uh, ideas that uh, uh, how to which, which extent the institution can really look. But for example, if you think about Twitter, it's all public out there and use our Twitter API, you can get this sort of data and also the, the followers and uh, how people are uh, retweeting each other, for example. And most of all, you are asking who is an influencer? Who is the person that by being overly positive about a topic is convincing the others also that is a good policy, right? So um, this could be also for a product, for example. There is the Slashdot forum that we analyze. Uh, uh, it's actually just to show you that it's not about mother social media. People were discussing things on the internet way before that. And we use the data from this uh, uh, forum because it was uh, uh, really talking about mostly politics and people were uh, just having clear ideas and clear debates. So we took this data and uh, the idea was to find this, uh, what, are, what people think about a precise political issue, are they against it or are they uh, pro, uh, it, are they in favor, and uh, who is an influencer. So what we did is on one side, we did the text analytics part, the sentiment analysis part, and we use the lexicon based one. So the simpler of the ones we have seen before. And on the other end, we use network mining. So that is basically to go and uh, analyze uh, the network and uh, to understand who is uh, an authority and who is an app. So who is a, a leader that is an influencer who is, uh, who is instead following all the others, uh, having many, uh, um, is, is following other users. So 
this can be done like we have seen before with sentiment analysis and network mining is only about building this graph and analyzing it. So how do you do this in one? You, you read the data of all those different forum threads, then you build a network based on each forum post, who is talking to who, and you can do this with the network uh, ex uh, extension of the network mining extension. You build your network and then you measure uh, the authority and the app score on each user and you come up with a leaderboard who based on those scores. And at the same time, you take the, all those forum posts and you make your lexicon based sentiment analysis more and, and you, you basically score each document, whether it's positive or negative. So at this point, we have uh, a document uh, scoring uh, algorithm, uh, and we, we also can connect uh, each document to the user who wrote the document. And so we know uh, who has the app score that is high and the sentiment uh, score of the document is low, and we can visualize it. How we could visualize it, like for example, in this scatter plot, each dot is a user, the color of the dot of the marker is whether it's usually mostly in favor or neutral or against a particular issue. And the, the position of the marker in the chart is based whether it's following a lot of user that is uh, uh, replying to a lot of firm thread or talking to another, so it's like a leader score. So if, for example, you see data 21 here is, uh, is uh, replied uh, uh, a lot and is also replying to many people. So is also in favor, is really active, that's good. Then we have uh, all those other ones, for example, Doc Ruby is uh, replying a lot, but not really people are replying to it. And then we have here, this other user that is always maybe using foul language, really against it. And it's not, it's there shouting, it's really loud, but it's not really being uh, listened that much, right? Because his app and leader score and follower score are kind of low. So that's also important. Yes, it's important that someone maybe is really uh, uh, having a lot of impact for what he's writing that is, uh, um, but many people are not really replying to. So it's interesting to combine those two kind of analysis at the same time. Okay, next topic up is entity recognition in documents. So what we want to do here is that we want to tag in a document whether a term is uh, uh, belonging to a certain gro group or not. For example, let's think of all this uh, biomedical literature and we want to find in the literature if that term is, for example, a disease or not a disease. And uh, there is also a node that is called the tag document viewer that you can use to actually see those uh, uh, tagged uh, elements. But um, how do you get them tagged in the first place? And uh, how can you do this automatically for thousands of documents? And why would you do it? So just imagine you have uh, medical tax records from an hospital, and those could be analyzed in aggregated and anonymous way so that you can write, tell away, find statistics on diabetes, for example. And of course, you could have someone that goes through all those text records and is manually tagging them, but this is uh, computation is uh, um, uh, expensive. So let's think, for example, that we take all these publications from uh, an online website called uh, uh, a repository called PubMed, and we take all those uh, documents from there, and we are going to then try to uh, tag the disease automatically there. So uh, to do this, we use this workflow that our, our co-worker did here at nine and is shared as well on the app. And you can see that after collecting a collection of disease names and collecting uh, a collection of documents from PubMed, we are going now to train a model to be able to tag the disease in those documents. And how do we do that? We need to um, use the Stanford NLP learner. Uh, the bottom, the top part takes the documents that are not tagged, and the dictionary of diseases is provided at the second input. Then we are going to train a model that is able to not just as a dictionary tagger find the terms and tag them, but to try to understand what other terms beside the one in dictionary should are diseases based on the structure of the sentence, based on uh, the root of the words and, and so on and so forth. 
So then you can reuse the model in, in two ways. One is to simply use it again on a partition of the data that has never seen the dictionary before. And uh, this is simply to tag more documents uh, using the same the model that was only trained on a subset of the documents. And the other way is to actually measure the performance. So this is the uh, Stanford um, learner. A node, as we said, the top port and the bottom port. The top is for document, the, doc, the bottom one is the dictionary. And uh, internally, it's also annotating all those documents and creating a model. The settings of this node is basically talking about whether you can use simple words, n-grams, that is two words uh, um, next to each other is a two-gram. So and is the number of subsequent words, and also whether it can use words within a words like substring, and what is the maximum length of an n-gram that it can use. So once you train the model, then you want to measure its performance. And what the Stanford NLP score does is that it's uh, using the model on its own, only the model, and is uh, tr trying to see how well it's doing compared to um, the dictionary itself. So of course, the problem is that the dictionary on the terms it knows is doing really well. You cannot really measure performance on terms that are now in the dictionary, which this model is able to tag. So it's a, it's a bit of an issue there. And then if you want to deploy the model, you would use the Stanford NLP tagger. All right, so we reach now the next topic, which is the topic de detection in documents with the LDA. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, section. And uh, we are going now to um, uh, keep on working now on a different idea, which is detecting the topic in a document. So uh, background story, this is kind of old now, but during the previous US election, there was a big scandal regarding the controversy of uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton that she was using a non government privately maintained email server. So at some point in 2015, Hillary Clinton was asked to release all these 7.9K emails to the US Department of State and Freedom uh, of Information Act. And basically the, the email then were publicly available on the State Department's website. And so you could analyze them. So how did we analyze them? Uh, we, you can also find them on Kaggle. We built this database to analyze them. And when you open them, it's basically uh, raw data. You have string for each of those fields. It's a string column, like uh, the body of the text, who is it from, who is it to, whether it's the date, the, day, uh, the date, and the, um, uh, the hour. There is lots of metadata. We can use the document viewer node to browse them. And for example, you can open one and you can actually see there are many also uh, private emails in this server. Like this person is asking, glad you were born, kiss you for me, blah, blah, blah. But what it's kind of hard to browse all those emails one by one and to find out what those emails are really talking about, right? Why don't we do this automatically? So to do this, we build a workflow and the workflow is reading the emails, cleaning them a bit, keeping only emails where there were at least three replies, converting those emails to a document, not just string columns, pre-processing them, but not stemming. And then we apply the topic extractor parallel LDA. So what this uh, model does is that it's sort of an unsupervised machine learning, which is able to cluster the documents together based on the uh, terms, uh, keywords it's using. So let's say that you have all those documents and you're going to extract for each doc document a topic. And for each topic, you have a collection of keywords which describe that topic. So you can maybe find out that some emails are about trade, conflict, and foreign. Some emails are about domestic, domestic internal, and welfare. And some other emails are about campaigns, polls, and elections. And maybe then it's a bit easier to go through those emails and find something interesting. So how do you use this node? Uh, it's, you need to provide exactly how many topics you want beforehand, and also how big, uh, what the, 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 each topic, what are the most uh, relevant words, what is the, site, the set of keywords that should be defined um, as a topic. 
And uh, each uh, document is seen as a distribution of words, of course, but each topic also is seen as a distribution of words. So you are trying to match uh, the document uh, to a topic uh, based on how similar those uh, words are. And uh, the doesn't use any syntax. It looks at the documents just like bag of words. So it doesn't look uh, at the order of the words, of the syntax, and how the period is built, and none of that. So the document order also is now important in the corpus. The same word can belong also to different topics. There is nothing against that. And the number of topics needs to be select and known in advance. Then, so it's, uh, it's a bit like k-means clustering. You need to know k in advance. So uh, this is the dialogue of the node. You need to provide the documents. And there is this alpha and this beta. Those two are parameters that you need to change in order to uh, tweak the algorithm to have a better performance. So um, by controlling alpha, you will have the documents will become more similar to each other from the point of view of distribution of words. And by controlling beta, you have the, the topics will appear more similar to each other and less uh, divided. So maybe it, the point here is to find a way so that the topics are really different and the documents are, are also um, not so uh, identical and this requires a bit of tweaking those two parameters so you end up with for example if we selected 10 different uh, uh, topics for this data set of emails five uh, keywords for each element and some stuff is not super clear but for example we can see topic three china party minister election labor or topic uh, i don't know six uh, you have uh, uh, government, FYI, Charlie, you can tell that some stuff is about military in Afghanistan, Iran. There is some sorting that is done correctly by this uh, automated uh, uh, model. So now that you have the model, what do you do? You can create an application. It's still a workflow, but it works as an application. You take this workflow, you move it to Nine server, and you make it available via the Nine web portal. Anyone can access this as long as they have a, a Nine browser, uh, 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 sorry, a web browser. So that is Chrome, Safari, doesn't matter. And once you access it, this is the way the, the old name web portal would look. You would then select which, which keywords you want, that is which topic you want to look at. And then you select, you click next. And then uh, the next page, you get the network of who Hillary was talking to when talking about these uh, topics. And uh, this is uh, a first attempt that you can use using uh, NIME to do uh, this kind of analysis. OK, so the next topic is about guided labeling. So this is about training a doc document classifier using machine learning, but we have no labels on our documents. So uh, supervised machine learning, you need to have already labeled documents, but we do not. We do not have labeled documents, and we have less label that we would usually need. Right? So this means that uh, uh, taking those labels for us to add more labels to the documents, we need to do it using an ex expensive expert. And this is uh, expensive. So we need to try to train something with as little label as we have. And also at the beginning, we have no labels at all. So how do we do this? Uh, this can be done for a like, sentiment analysis. You have tweets, you have no labels. You have articles, you want to detect what they are talking about, but you don't want to use LDA because you know already that you have exactly those categories and you want them to be applied by an expert. So really precise categorization done with machine learning. But again, we have no labels, so what do we do? We can use active learning. So what is the active learning general idea? We start with uh, lots of data points and no labels. Then we start this active learning loop initialization where we are going to pick unlabeled data points, that is documents that have no labels, and show them to the expert. The expert is going to read those documents and say, this is positive sentiment, this is negative uh, sentiment, this is uh, about this uh, issue, this is not about this issue, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the expert is labeling but only a sample of them. And so we can start only by this first random sample, we can then start the active, the active learning loop, um, the real thing. So from now on, we're going to always learn from the little sample we have. And based on what the model learns, we can then suggest what the expert should label next. 
and then we then can train again and then we can measure again what is the most interesting things that we can show to our expensive expert and do it again and again and again and that's what's called a human in the loop because the human is part of the loop that is training the model is actively working with the model in order to get this AI, this machine learning model to learn how to label documents. It's basically teaching the model how to do this job. Okay, but the critical part is how do you propose to the expert what really matters to the model? How do you select one or few critical documents to be labeled? And we want to do this not in a random fashion. We want to do this intelligently. So this means that we can use, for example, the label density and the model uncertainty. So label density is about using, showing to the expert what the model has never seen before. And so it's likely to learn something. And model uncertainty means showing to the expert where the model is not really sure of his prediction. So he might need some help. These two concepts goes, the label density is for exploring and the model uncertainty is for exploiting around the decision boundary where the model needs more help. There is a formula to do this, which use the uh, entropy score on one side and the, the, the label density is basically just looking how dense is the distribution in the feature space. And uh, you can do all of this with active learning uh, extension of NIME. Those are simple nodes that you can use and measure and, and loop and label and, and you can build your active learning application like that. Now, beside active learning, there is another way to do this. It's called weak supervision. This is uh, in recent time a bit more um, attractive, I would say, also because it's uh, not as old. Uh, weak supervision is the idea that you have a user that is providing those labeling functions to basically label those documents automatically. So for example, you could say, whenever there is this word in the document, label it as such. If the word is not in this document, do not label it at all. And you can create many of those labeling functions in order to create this generative model. The generative model then is able to um, find out which of these labeling function can be trusted and measure its accuracy by comparing with the other labeling functions. And in the end, you will have enough probabilistic training labels to train the final model. In nine, uh, this will, uh, let's make an example. Maybe it's a bit clear. Document classification example, you have this document, there is no label and the, the rule goes, if there is the word awesome movie in this movie review, please label it as positive sentiment review. But now let's say an example. This labeling function wants to label another one, which says, this was a really great movie. It says great movie. It doesn't say awesome movie. So the labeling function won't work. But by having many of those really simple, simple labeling functions, then you're able to train something with it. Now, uh, this is how it looks in NIME when you have many labeling functions. And this is what the, a model is uh, able to learn from. So um, you fit this in the generative model and you train your final model. This looks, uh, the generative model is the first one that is reading the labeling functions, is those two new nodes that we have new, I mean, they were released uh, almost a year ago and you can find them in the weak supervision extension and you can combine them with uh, uh, a granular booster trees, a logistic regression or the Keras nodes, because those are able to read this really peculiar way of uh, aggregating those labels from the labeling functions. Okay, but what do you, should you use then? Active learning or weak supervision? Uh, why not both, right? We can combine those two systems together and come up, for example, with a human in the loop guided labeling application. And that's also what is uh, all this uh, blog series about. Go check it out. I wrote it with Adrian, another co-worker and I'm, and I think it's a really cool story to see how active learning week supervision can be used together in an interactive application available from the NIME web portal. And uh, this can be done for sentiment analysis, can be used for topic detection, and you take the workflow, you move it to NIME server, and then from the NIME web portal, you use it to label your documents and automatically train your models. 
uh, this uh, workflow is available on Nine Hub. And for example, if you take the component in the middle, this is the one that is always shown uh, iteration after iteration to the human in the loop, where it's able to change labeling function and provide more labels at the same time and use active learning and weak supervision together. So this, uh, this uh, is available on the app, like all the other workflows uh, um, or almost all the other workflow I've shown you. Uh, I hope that they were, were provided to you via chat by Christiane. And uh, here we are, we are almost at the end of the workshop. There is now the nine online uh, uh, courses that I would like to present to you. We have four different level of um, levels. And you can see here the level four is here introduction to text processing is something that you would like to take to learn in detail by detail in a um, one week course each day you have a session and exercise for the next day and you can learn how to use the nine text processing extension um, and also uh, uh, scott made the course is in the q a session and maybe you have seen him uh, answering all those questions so NIME analytics platform and NIME server are covered. And at the end, theoretically, you can take also NIME certifications. Uh, additionally, we have the NIME full summit incoming uh, that is between November 16 and November 20th. And it will be uh, online given uh, the current situation, but please join us. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, fun to see all the things that we are doing at NIME. And uh, all those are all the different platforms that you can find, abdo9.com. I suggest you to look and find out those different workflows. Okay, I have a question here. Can you tag a common a document using a multi-level taxonomy? Uh, I think I will uh, follow up on this question later. We have a forum thread, um, uh, which I hope it's, it was linked during the presentation that you can use to uh, uh, follow up with those questions. Uh, Multi-labeling in text analytics uh, is possible. You just uh, uh, need to probably, in NIME, it's best if you either use one more than one model. Uh, so the question was, uh, Priyanka Saria, how do you do multi-labeling in text analytics? Uh, the answer in this is when you have a document that does and cannot just have a single label, but has more of them, you need to create a, a special kind of model. And uh, this can be done uh, in multiple ways. You can have more than uh, one model that is trained on the different, uh, that is then joined together. Uh, deep learning is also really good with this. And um, please follow up also in the conversation. Um, I will now go on Slido to see if people are, hang on a second. All right, uh, I will wait a few moments for more questions. Otherwise, I will close the webinar here. So on, let's quickly go on Slido and go on a second. Okay, not too bad for now. Please keep on reviewing. You simply need to go slido.com and type in text nine. And uh, let's see if there is Another question. Okay, so Troy Eddy asks, what approach can you use to address poor user in the loop tagging? So um, what we did uh, when mixing labeling functions with the uh, user tagging, we treated the user labels just like another labeling function. So weak supervision is trained within the human in the loop, and it will try to estimate also the accuracy of the, um, of the, of the model. So in the end, it, it, should be, um, um, it should be automatically detected if the user 
as a bad accuracy labeling function. Then, of course, if you want to pay a guy to be in a human in the loop and he's not able to do this work better than the model uh, or better than a labeling function, maybe uh, it shouldn't be labeling at all. So I would suggest using a human in the loop application when the, the user has a good accuracy in scoring prediction. Uh, so this was answered. Let's go to the next one. So I'm answering Ignacio Perez. Can sentient analysis be done in other languages? Are there any POS neg dictionaries? So to use the positive negative words dictionaries, we download it from the internet. So all nine does is to read a CSV file with a collection of positive and negative words that we found on the internet. So if you found on the internet online someone sharing a similar dictionary in, let's say, Spanish, then it will work the same. Regarding instead the Stanford NLP models, which instead are tagging part of speeches and stuff that really depends on the different kind of language, then you can check online when you download the extension how many languages we cover, but I think that by now we cover quite many. So uh, if you want to use the Stanford nodes of nine, you, you should be able to find also the ones that cover your language, unless it's, uh, it's not one of the most spoken languages. So let us know about that. Okay, so uh, Terry Kim, any suggestion on how to roll out a prototype to other user and organization for applying the prototype to other data set? Is there a way to customize this so other users need only minimal familiarity with NIME? Um, so in NIME, uh, um, I'm trying to understand your question correctly. So uh, right now in NIME, you can build a workflow and share it via the NIME server with other workers. If they have NIME analytics platform, they can access and edit the work for themselves, otherwise they cannot. If you think that these kind of users should have access to the workflow, but they should not have access uh, in the, in, to the actual nodes, so only to the analysis, then they can use the NIME web portal. The NIME web portal will expose to them only the level of um, detail that is necessary via web app. So at each stage, they can sort of ask, uh, you can ask them, do you want to go A or B? And behind there is a workflow that is actually implementing either one setting of a node or another. So basically you can expose all the complexity of the workflow and show via the NIME web portal, via a web-based web application, only the settings you want. Uh, so I was answering, uh, this point, and I, I add of that team. I think it's a, it's a really good for a business analysts. They just want to connect, get the data, uh, and then download an Excel file or a report or only uh, the accuracy of the model without even dragging a single node. All right. All right. So this was answered. Is there a note to detect language? Mod fights heal me. Maybe we have a component. I would suggest to look on the app and open a forum thread if you cannot find anything. I think we have a component that is able to translate. Uh, I need to double check on that. Um, then uh, Xinque Tzu, thank Paolo the webinar is great, full valuable information. See you next best time, Julia, okay. Thank you, Julia. Dian Apripadi, about the literature review, is it only from PubMed or from the search engine like Scopu, Web Science, et cetera? We uh, use uh, REST API services to connect to PubMed. So you can really connect to any other literature repository. So it's, um, it's really, uh, it really depends uh, on whether this kind of repository you want offers a REST API. Uh, and then you can use nodes 
in nine that they can connect and get the data directly in. Uh, text mining in how many languages tried off? I need to double check uh, how many libraries we offer, but I think it's mostly the most popular ones. Not the, uh, I don't think we, we can cover more than the, 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 the most spoken one. Uh, uh, I need to double check on that. Please guys use the forum if I was not able to answer your question. Thank you, Gurdip. And Trinkaya, uh, how do you do multi-labeling text analytics? This question was already asked. I believe that you need to, uh, in I'm have a, a special setup for that. And I believe it's probably deep learning. And uh, maybe we should follow up in the forum. Besides my correct option, the tag filter doesn't apply to my data. What could be the reason? Like this, I really could not uh, provide you with a, uh, an answer. Uh, I need to see your workflow. If you can, please share it on uh, online forum and we will help you as soon as possible. Um, I, we need at least a screenshot of the configuration and of the input data. Thank you, Anna. All right, unless there are any other questions, I would end the webinar here. So thank you for joining. Please uh, reach out on the Nine Forum. There is a thread. It will also be sent to you via email. And please reach out there also to find any available link. So uh, was a quick general overview. I hope I gave you an idea to what's possible in Nine. Thank you, everyone and uh, see you in the next webinar.